on the <laughs> midweek. Um, if if it's all right with you, um, I would also um, I would like I, I have a I have another concert on Friday Friday lecture. Um, five fifty to five o'clock to five fifty. So I. Uh, Figure, I also think that I, I, I'm going to, I, I think I should, I, you know, I have a very, I mean, a very nice audience and a, a very good questions and stuff. So I'm going to do my best to figure out what I can about these other questions. I, I've been reluctant. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of other questions, which I will summarize today, but there's a bunch of other questions on uh, what one would do uh, with uh, the pure motivic Galois group and the automorphic Galois group. Um, and there's lots of questions and I'm going to, I just will summarize those questions today, but then I will um, do my best uh, to say what I think should be the answers or should, should be part of the answers to these questions. I've been reluctant to, to do that because I, I really, it's kind of, um, rash of me to do this when I don't really understand uh, uh, a lot of stuff in it. So, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to spend, I'm going to work hard. I was going to work hard on it today, but my computer went uh, bad, but um, I'm going to work on these things. And so I think what I will do on Friday is uh, th there's some unfinished business and it was questions six and seven from Langland's paper. And uh, that also entails a, a little bit of a um, um, little bit of a few words about the vague group. Um, so that's going to that's going to be a break in what we're doing. So I will do that on Friday, and then I don't know whether that would go into Monday. But then, um, uh, and I will use that time to try to understand more about these things I'm going to talk about, and then on Monday uh, I will start uh, trying to say what one might expect for these extensions, uh, these further questions. And the further questions I, I do think are very interesting. I mean, well, they're, odd, they're, they're natural questions that have to be considered. Um, um, okay, so, so the, way, the way we left it last time was that there's a putative construction of the automorphic Langlands group which maps as a covering of the Vey group. These are locally compact groups and which maps uh, F as a global field, number field. And I'll recall that uh, this is supposed to map into the automorphic Galois group, um, which maps uh, onto the uh, its analog for the Vey group, the so-called Tanyama group, uh, which, like the Vey group, maps onto uh, the Galois group of the algebraic closure. And um, this group uh, is pretty simple in many ways. I mean, the construction of it seems pretty simple. Uh, it just it's just little pieces of automorphic representations with a certain property, namely that they should be of Hodge type relative to uh, the embedding of the, the local embeddings into here, uh, into here, which they inherit from the local embeddings into there uh, at the Archimedean places. It should be a Hodge type. And um, I also mentioned that uh, this group is a complex the way it's set up here uh, this is a complex group gf and uh, the tanyama group um, these are complex groups now that's not really quite that's not really natural for them they're not uh, they're not really supposed to be complex groups they're supposed to be finer than that but these are complex groups
I mean, you want them to be complex groups if you're going to embed this locally compact group into them. You want them to look a little bit like uh, um, L groups, where you, you were quite used to embedding locally, or mapping locally compact groups into L groups. So for the, from the point of view of this, we would like them to be complex groups. But that's not really, as I understand it, not really the, the, where they're really supposed to be. Uh, these are complex groups, um, if, which, but which require you to fix an embedding. of f, this number field, into the complex numbers. Okay, so that's what uh, we have. Uh, I haven't said terribly much about how it's given, but it's uh, how, how, these, how these conjectural um, or hoped for uh, constructions of these groups should go, but um, it's, it, it involves um, automorphic representations and a certain property of their L functions. Okay, so um, I want, so what I'll try to do today is to say uh, what, this is really just the beginning. If one wants to, uh, if one wants to understand how, question. yes, question, yes. Yes. It's no, it's pure motives. Pure oh, motives. Is it, uh, is it possible to specialize this picture to a single variety? Like, uh, oh, yes, yes, that would be. I mean, you, you'd be, uh, I mean, again, the details of how it would work for a single variety, you'd need to have something to keep track of the weights. So, so that would be the cohomology, right, of a, vari of a variety. Um, so in any case, it would be a quotient. It would be, it, it, this is a pro-algebraic thing and you'd, you'd, you'd need a, 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 a quotient of that. Um, I don't think anything's been done in that direction. Um, uh, there is stuff on modular forms, uh, so I guess that'd be like elliptic curves. Um, I mean, that is it's not explicitly like this, but it would would be related to this. Um, um, so this is, um, but 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 there's much more that would be extremely interesting to think about and to answer. So this is just the beginning, and um, um, we would like to answer. Uh, try to answer. Uh, this is just conjecture, of course, conjecturally. Um, following, I would say these to me, these are seem like pressing questions. Um, all right. What about, well, in order to be able to talk about periods um, properly, um, at least what I understand from the very nice sort of um, expository, little expository articles by Andre, um, what I think you really, before you can really talk about periods, so this would be the next step. For periods, so it's what I just said a moment ago. It turns out that GF. So F is actually a separate field. It's not the field over which this is supposed to be defined. Um, that the group, that the group. GF above, which we have to find uh, treating as a complex group. So the group above is a set of complex points. Uh, 
um, of a group over Q. A pro-algebraic group, just like, just like GF, a pro-algebraic group over Q. And what we would like to know explicitly, I mean, this is sort of explicit, uh, this is an uh, explicit construction, we would like to know um, what um, would be its structure over Q. And I don't, it, it, this shouldn't be hard to answer conjecturally, but I don't know the answer. What is its Q structure? Um, uh, Sarah tells us in his article, there's a very nice article by Sarah actually on, on these things, on, on uh, motivic, Gal, motivic Galois groups, at least properties that they should have. Um, um, pure motivic Galois groups. It's in the, um, the there was an AMS uh, special summer session in 1994 on motives, two volumes on motives. Um, and Sarah has a very nice, Sarah, of course, writes beautifully, and he has a very nice article. He says that. Um, If, if no, let me see if I get this right. If you take a different embedding of F into C, it'll still be a complex group. Um, but Ser says, if I remember it correctly, it changes the Q structure of the group, of the underlying group, which we're not talking about here. We are not that refined. That's what we want over there. If you choose a different embedding of F into C, it changes the Q structure of G by an inner twist. So I don't quite see how that goes, but it's that's a pretty good clue as to what we should be looking for. And I, I, I'm not going to write that down. There's another thing that you can say. Uh, when the Q structure should um, uh, uh, when you have an <coughs> excuse me, when you have an L-adic representation, it's actually not um, I mean, when you take the L-adic uh, realization of the motivic Galois group, that's like looking at the group of L-adic points um, in this group over Q. Um, but it, uh, it might not be a split group. Even it might not be a split group, because uh, as, you, as you know, if you take an L-adic representation attached to a motive, um, it, uh, it's really, it, it's not always an L attic representation. It's what people call a lambda attic representation, where lambda is uh, represents a completion of a of a, a field extension of Q. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they do that. Langlands does that in his Antwerp article, and so that's another clue that um, that that has to do with the outer twist, the quasi split uh, structure. Uh, of which the inner twist would be a form. So I don't know if that makes any sense, and, but, but that's another clue as to what you should, one should be looking for here. And I'm sure it's not difficult, but yes. When you say that Sarah says that uh, it will, taking a different embedding will change the Q structure by an inner twist? Yes. You, you mean that uh, this might happen or, or that you can clearly see in some- No, 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 he says it will. He says it will happen. So he, he knows something that he's not saying. He says, it, I guess it's, I, I think it's probably elementary, but I haven't, haven't really thought about it. Um, yes. Um, I'm afraid, I was afraid somebody was going to ask me that question and I didn't review it. Uh, the number field is, uh, there are two fields, uh, there's, uh, um, there's the number field, um, and uh, I'm sorry, I just can't answer that question. Um, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll answer it on Friday. Do, does anybody know? But, but that's not the one, that's Q. There's really two fields. There's F and there's Q. And um, 
um, that they're unrelated. Um, sorry, I'm, I, I can't answer your question right now. Uh, I, I, um, there's two ways to think of a motive. One is as a piece of an algebraic variety. So it's like a little, uh, you can break the algebraic variety up into little pieces. Um, but it's also uh, a universal um, uh, structure for its cohomology. And these two fields actually pertain to these two different roles, if that's of any help. Anyway, I'll look it up. I'll look it up and on Friday, try to say something about it. The other field, I think, is what for the uh, For? So there's the field definition. Yes. No, I think that's the Q. That's the Q. That's the Q. That's, that's the Q. And F is a definition. Um, no, no, I think F is something different. Uh, I, 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 the Q structure, um, I mean, um, and it's uh, an inner, tw I mean, the group has a Q structure, um, uh, but choosing this, uh, choosing this different complex embedding, um, uh, gives a different completion of the, or gives it, pertains to the Q structure. I, I, I'm, okay, sorry, I'm not really. That's right, that's right. Uh, there's not difficulty, it's just that it's, um, I have, I think it's not known, certainly in this construction, how you would specify the structure of this group over Q. Uh, it's, um, uh, but uh, you do want a Q structure. Um, um, I mentioned, mo I mentioned periods, um, the description of periods. Right at the beginning of the talk, having to do with um, um, so this was uh, I think part two of the lecture um, had to do with um, uh, the Duran theorem and the fact that you could um, have so if you recall. Uh, you, the Betty, so it was a, it was the description of periods in two was uh, basically the contrast between if you have say a variety um, over Q, um, the uh, periods were the contrast between the Duram representation of the cohomology or the Duram uh, realization of the, of the underlying motive and the Betty realization. And remember, the Betty realization automatically could be done over Q. The Duram realization, I guess, is the theorem of Grotendieck, which says that uh, if the variety is over Q, you can actually have the Duram um, complex over Q. I mean, I'm simplifying it. And so you can do a pairing between two Q rational vector spaces. However, the pairing, um, which comes uh, uh, by uh, the pairing is doesn't get done, matched over Q. It's uh, it's over the complex numbers. You're only changing the, the two rational vectors, the two vector spaces over which the pairing goes. The pairing is given by evaluating um, uh, by pairing the cohomology um, from a site between a cycle and a, a, a differential form. And that gives a period, that gives a matrix. If you choose a basis of the Betty cohomology, a basis of the cycles, and a basis of the differential forms, both of which you can do now over Q, if the variety is defined over Q, you can pair them and you're going to get a matrix. But the matrix is not over Q, it's of complex numbers. And uh, moreover, um, there's something non-canonical about doing that. There's not a canonical basis of the Q structure 
um, for the Betty cohomology or a canonical basis uh, of the Q structure for the rational differential forms. So it's a, a matrix, it's a matrix if you choose two bases, but it's just, um, um, uh, it, it doesn't have a basis. What that means is um, um, that the motivic Galois group or rather the Q points of the motivic Galois group acts. You can make uh, an algebra out of the uh, entries in the matrix. Uh, those, are, those entries are what uh, ca um, can be defined as periods. You can make an algebra out of those things and GQ acts uh, on the periods Given as, uh, as numbers, um, I guess you would separate them. They're complex numbers, but I guess you'd separate them into real and, ima real and imaginary parts. Um, so it uh, acts on the periods um, given um, as complex numbers. Um, by GQ. That's just because you don't have a canonical basis. On the other hand, you expect to have a canonical Q group there, and it acts on, uh, it acts on this uh, like a Galois group. That's why it's called the motivic Galois group. And that's why we want to know the Q structure. We want things, if we want things explicit, we want to know the Q structure of this group. Okay. Um, B, uh, mixed motives. No, no, they don't act. Uh, well, I guess they would act, but um, I mean, we're interested in these complex numbers, this n squared complex numbers in this matrix. We're interested in those things, um, whether they're algebraic or transcendental, we're interested in their behavior. Um, um, beyond the rational numbers. We're interested in their possible transcendental behavior. So we wouldn't want to, we'd mess them up if we had the complex group acting on them. We'd lose all the structure. So this now has a very intricate structure. These matrices have a very intricate structure that depends only on this group of Q points. Is it, is it easy to say how, how they act? Is it because of the... Oh yeah, it's just, just, it's just they just act because you don't have the ability to choose canonical bases of the two Q rational vector spaces on, on which you have a pairing. Right. So, so in, in other words, if you have the period pairing, which is like a linear map of matrix, you, you can pre-compose by uh, some element of the motivic Galois group because that will act on the cohomology itself, right? It's, 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 it's just, as I understand it, it's just, it's simpler than that. <laughs> Excuse me. It's just it acts and, and it's there simply because you cannot choose canonical rational bases of these two rational vector spaces. Uh, the, uh, the period matrix is a bilinear pairing between two rational vector spaces, but uh, the pairing um, takes complex values. And um, uh, it, so I shouldn't really be calling it a matrix uh, because I don't have bases of these vector spaces. So you, um, uh, uh, the Galois group acts on these, these periods are, the, are what the entries of this matrix would be if you fixed a base, these two bases, but they're not given that structure. And so the, um, 
the obstruction then to not to not having that structure is uh, this group and how it acts on those that those and 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 n squared uh, it's an n squared it's it's an algebra uh, it's an n squared dimensional algebra over the complex numbers on which these rational groups act this rational group acts that makes sense okay mixed motives um so the group gf um it's just uh the reductive group um it's just the reductive part pardon me um yes yes did i say a full reductive algebraic group yeah is the i could say I'm, I'm going to call it reductive, but it's a pro-algebraic. It's understood to be pro-algebraic, yes. It's just the reductive uh, part of the full. So the motivic Galois group really is not reductive. It's, a, it's an arbitrary pro-algebraic group of the, the full mixed motivic Galois group. Um, GF, I'm going to write it as GF plus, and it's a semi-direct product. Any, so we can think of, I mean, it's, you're right, it's pro-algebraic group, but we can just think of it, I mean, any finite quotient of it is just an algebraic group, which we're now saying, well, we, it's really defined over Q, but in any case, uh, pro, uh, uh, an algebraic group over Q um, is always, um, a semi-direct product of its reductive part with its unipotent part, unipotent radical. So this is going to be a semi-direct product of the group we've just uh, conjecturally set up with um, UF for a unipotent group. Uf um, over Q. What is its structure? So we would like the explicit structure. What's the explicit structure? Of Uf. Um, as a group over Q, the pro unipotent group, algebraic group over Q, as a group over Q, and it's more than just a group over Q, it's a group over Q on which this group, which we're assuming, and once we put the rational structure on it, we're assuming that this is very explicit, conjecturally. Um, so uh, we'll want to know, as a group over Q, on which GF acts. So this is this is not this is an extension that splits. So um, that means it's semi-direct product. And to know it uh, completely, you would have to know this. You'd have to know this, but you'd also have to know how this acts by automorphisms on this. So that's what we're asking for here. Um, so this is, uh, um, I, I won't write it down here. So I'll, I wanna talk about what we should hope this should be next week. Um, but uh, there, much has been done on a very special case of this, uh, the so-called Tate mixed motivic Galois group. And that would be the quotient that would be um, the quotient of this group um, given by, if you take a quotient 
of this reductive part um, and leave this alone, that's still, that's going to give a quotient of uh, this group. And there is an extreme quotient of this group um, in which um, we have um, uh, the Ve group, but it's not really the Ve group, it's the Tanyama group. But the Tanyama group maps, um, there's a one dimensional character on the Tanyama group, which comes from the Tate motive. And so there's a, a quotient uh, of this group that almost annihilates almost everything um, except for uh, the Tate motive here, which is just um, uh, essentially the absolute value. And so uh, uh, this, there's a, people have studied this, and the quotient of that is called the Tate motivic Galois group, and they have written down explicitly what the structure of that quotient is. So here, this acts by simply taking uh, um, ca uh, characters parameterized by uh, the integers. Um, um, it acts on this thing, and this thing uh, is a free unipotent group with generators in the, uh, parameterized by three, five, seven, nine, 11 and so on. Um, and what that means is that this group acts on these generators um, by the character by the character of so the, the, the quotient of this um, is the a quotient of, of on which uh, this the, the multiplicative group is all that's left and it acts on these generators by simply taking the character of this thing, uh, three, five, uh, five, seven, and so on. Um, and those, that's, those odd numbers are no surprise, I, I'm, I'm, I guess, for people that have worked on these things. They are precise the, no, the leader of the numbers which, uh, for which the, cor the Riemann zeta function um, doesn't have an explicit formula. Uh, the number you can do zeta of two, zeta of four, zeta, zeta of six, but uh, the Tate motivic Galois group um, uh, has generators on which parameterized by the action of this uh, by the integers three, five, seven, nine, and eleven. So you guys know let's know this, but this people have worked on this for some time, and. Um, it's now completely understood. I think Francis Brown finished up what was um, uh, needed for this. And so, but you want something like that in general. But I think it's possible. I mean, it's possible to copy what, what happens in the Tate Motivic Galois group to write down uh, what the analog of this should be. So I'd like to talk about that next week. Um, Yes. This is this is people have worked on it, I think, well before Francis Brown, but he finished up. Uh, um, Sasha will know better than me, but I think uh, Francis Brown figured uh, figured out the last steps in the actual proof of its uh, of its of, of the theorem that says that's what it is. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, see exponential motives. Um, okay, so uh, uh, again, uh, these things I really, I, 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 I feel a little, I, I feel a bit uncomfortable talking about them because I really, I mean, I really should be have spent more time thinking about them. I've spent a lot of time, but you need a lot more time. Uh, so exponential motives. So, I, uh, um, Walid, I think knows perhaps more about these, uh, at least as some aspects of these than I do, but uh, the number E. So periods, the periods that 
are defined uh, as the complex numbers that come into the pairing of uh, the, the Stokes pairing between uh, on, on uh, algebraic varieties um, in the pure case and in, in this case. Um, they're numbers, they're complex numbers, and they're, those are what are called periods, roughly speaking, more or less. I think you have to separate them into the real and imaginary parts to, so that the periods are real numbers, but in any case, those are what are called periods. The number E, however, it's a lot of, I mean, pi is a period, and many, many uh, examples, um, values of the Riemann zeta function at uh, int positive integers are periods, uh, and so on, lots of uh, um, and lots of other numbers that uh, uh, we would like to know are periods. Number e, however, is not a period. And so I'm, I'm not sure I can say a reasonable explanation of that. Um, but I, I would just uh, one can look in I mentioned um, a week ago that there's this lovely 13 page article of uh, Eve Andre. He explains all of this, why E is not a period. Uh, and he also explains that there is something more, an extension of this theory. Um, that gives a larger algebra than just the algebra of periods. It belongs to a larger Q algebra. Uh, called exponential periods. And stuff is known about that. Uh, the, the, I guess the main thing, um, um, but, but let me just say that we expect there to be an exponential motivic Galois group. So uh, let's say with its own um, universal group, So I've already used um, the plus symbol uh, for the uh, for the full motivic, uh, including the mixed motivic Galois group. So where did I write that down? Yes, I'm using a plus for that. So I have to use something else. There should be its own universal um, group, which would map onto the motivic Galois group. Um, uh, so let me write let me write that as G um, um, F um, plus that's the motivic Galois group. So let me put a tilde on top of it. So what's the uh, um, the explicit structure? of G. Let's assume we've solved question B. We have an explicit structure conjecturally for the full motivic Galois group. Now, well, we want more. Now, what's the explicit structure of G plus tilde? Um, and I want more, we would want more than that. Uh, an explicit description of the extension. That is to say, how it maps, it's a, it would be a covering group of the motivic Galois group. Uh, no plus, no tilde on that, it would be with the extension. Now there's something known about this uh, that, um, that Kumar, I think, got an advanced preview on it. So we'd be wanting, uh, uh, some analog of this. This is this this is this is this Tanyama group is known. 
I mean, it has a very explicit formula. I mean, some of its properties would, might still be conjectural, but this has a very explicit formula. But if there's some other, this, this sits in the reductive part of the motivic Galois group. Uh, this is, um, that doesn't pertain to the um, uh, unipotent part. That's part of the reductive part. So uh, if this exponential Galois group is gonna have to be some version of this rather explicit group. And there is. Um, um, the exponential analog. So um, I don't, I'm, I feel uncomfortable with the Tanyama group, but well, I shouldn't. I mean, it's very explicit. I mean, it's very well presented. Uh, Langlands gave an explicit two co-cycle for constructing it as an extension of the Serre group. Um, so, uh, uh, so this should be regarded as something we, we know reasonably well. So, uh, so is the, uh, its analog for the exp exponential. Uh, so the exponential analog of the Tanyama group Um, so let's write it as T tilde of F is due to I mean we don't know that it how it we don't know what the we don't know that what the exponential Galois group looks like, but this should surely be um, the analog of the Ve group or the Tanyama group in whatever that ends up being. And this is due to Greg Anderson. And it's a long time ago. It's amazing uh, that these things have been around for so long. 1986. Uh, I forget the title of his paper, but it, this was refereed by Kumar. <laughs> well, it's a nice, it's a nice report, nice referees report. I, I'm amazed that you were able to work your way through it because it's. Um, there's a lot of a lot of nasty. I won't say nasty, but there's a lot of sophisticated number theory in this construction, at least to my eyes. And uh, one wants to one wants to answer this question. One should one needs to study this paper, and the review is very helpful, I think, in doing that. Okay, so that's what. Uh, oh my goodness. So um, I will try to say next week what this uh, should be, or where we should be looking for the analog of the um, motivic Galois group, namely the exponential motivic Galois group. What else? I've got five minutes. Um, so again, I think uh, Waleed's been talking with regularly with Marco, so he would know uh, more, much more about this than um, I do. Feynman amplitudes. So I think that we believe uh, that um, exponential periods, there's something wrong with Feynman integrals this was explained to me by Marco uh, year, some years ago. Exponential periods, the Feynman, Feynman amplitudes by Feynman diagrams work very well in a very limited situation, quantum electrodynamics. Exponential periods, okay, so there's periods would uh, be attached to, to this group. So exponential periods, um, seem to describe um, terms in the calculation of Feynman um, 
amplitudes. I use these words without any <laughs> understanding of them, but uh, 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 from Feynman diagrams. So there's a prescription for um, describing um, uh, how you attach um, um, periods in the sense that we were talking about up there uh, to Feynman graphs, which are Feynman diagrams. Um, the fact that they don't quite get the job done is immaterial, um, but there's a well-known algorithm for attaching uh, motivic periods to Feynman diagrams, and that's the subject of a long paper, very nicely written by uh, Francis Brown in 2015. He explains very clearly how with a Feynman graph or Feynman diagram, how you can attach a, um, a number to it, a period. Did you want to ask, say something? No, no, how are you going to attach a, a period to it? But um, it seems that they, 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 this process works very well. And this is Marco explained this to me. This process works very well for quantum electrodynamics. The, un, the feeling is that it should be exactly right when you're dealing with a physical situation with um, uh, of a free part free particles which have no interactions between them you still have something quite complex and it's thought that Feynman diagrams explain that quantum electrodynamic quantum electrodynamics is closely related to that in that it's a modification of it but it is um, that there's a uh, that it's close that the uh, thing the we, we the uh, the Lagrangian by which you modify it is sufficiently small that it's still very close, but it's not quite accurate even in that case. So we, I mean, I guess one hopes is that is that right? Do you, do we hope that exponential motives, exponential periods should help with the Feynman amplitudes, or do we not think that, or do we not know? Yes. Oh, is that so? Is that so? So she's she's written about that more recently. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So anyway, they're they're relevant, and we would certainly want to know what the exponential motivic Galois group is, and um, I'm I've. You haven't quite finished. Uh, there's just, just one other question uh, that has to do with, um, um, I'll, I'll say more words about this maybe on Monday. And on Friday, we'll talk about the VEI group, uh, uh, quite the Langland's questions. Um, so the, the last one would be um, automorphic period, uh, so uh, motivic periods. So that's just in the sense of uh, uh, what I mentioned over, not exponential even, but just uh, this, just in the sense of A. Um, um, uh, motivic periods. There's another notion. So, so um, I mean, the motivic, the way um, Zage and um, Konsevich set it up. It's, they define periods simply as the transcendental numbers that occur in the matrix um, uh, in, uh, say, for an, an, they define it for an algebraic variety, but they say that Grothendieck uh, said that that um, picture has a refinement, that it works for motives rather than just algebraic varieties. But in any case, those are motivic periods that come up here. But there's a completely different notion of periods that is defined for automorphic representations.
So I guess I guess you can sort of guess what you hope for. You hope that every uh, motivic period, you hope for a reciprocity here. This this is something that comes. Uh, so this is motivic periods. I guess the most famous name attached to that is Balenson. He's got all these conjectures, or he's got so he's got fundamental conjectures that I don't really quite understand. And um, uh, but there's a there are conjectures for these things too. They go by the name of Gan Gross Prasad. And these are diff defined a little bit differently. And so the situation here is just like re what you hope for. This is like reciprocity. Um, all of these things are kind of like reciprocity. We're asking for an analog of, well, anyway, uh, we're asking for, we really are asking for this group. I mean, this all starts with a putative formula for the group um, LF. And we're wondering how that would it could, it could be extended. That's the only, that's the explicit thing, and all of these other things should be explicit uh, somehow consequences of it. And so we're asking for something of the sort here too. This could be reciprocity for periods. Is every motivic period just like is every motive? Um, does every motive come from an automorphic representation? Is every motivic period an automorphic period? And it seems to me that one needs to answer that as well. These, in some sense, are maybe more a little more explicit. And uh, I'll say perhaps a little bit about what these are next week. Um, tomorrow, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, yes, yes. So it's what it's what Fiona works on. It's what Fiona works on. The, the, those are the local analogs of automorphic periods, the local components of automorphic periods. Um, so lots of people work on those, but they don't work on the people. Lots of people work on these, and lots of people work on these, but there's not terribly much overlap. Um, So we'll meet at, uh, at five on, on Friday.